Okay, well, uh, thanks folks for joining today. Uh, we're uh, Todd and Dean and I are excited to give you a little bit of a virtual tour of our friends down south of the border, uh, specifically Mexico. So we're hoping to make it uh, hopefully fun and, and interactive. Just take a quick look at your tour guides. Uh, that's me, uh, Doug Nielsen on the left there. Todd's in the middle there. Actually, our executive director, Mark Mueller, is on the right, and one of our partners in Mexico is on the left. And then we've got Dina, who's on the left. And um, uh, in the middle, that's me again. We've got uh, the rector of San Pablo Seminary, Amos, who's on, on the left there. So uh, we'll be your tour guides for the next few minutes. So our agenda for today, kind of the part of our tour, we'll give you a little bit of an introduction to Mexico, some of the sights and sounds, and a little bit of background on uh, both Mexico as well as how the Protestant Church as well as the Presbyterian Church has developed over the years in country. And then we'll shift a little bit to get a little more of a deep dive on what the Outreach Foundation is doing uh, in Mexico, both with some seminaries, a, a new initiative with the National Presbyterian Church of Mexico, and then we'll end up with uh, Todd Luke uh, giving us an update on all the work he's been doing for quite a few years down in southern Mexico building cisterns. So that's kind of our, our guide book for the day. So if you think about Mexico, you, uh, if somebody says, what do you, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? You may think, well, let's see, maybe tequila, maybe Corona, maybe Aztecs, maybe refugees at the border, maybe Mayans. It's, it, I guess I'd say it's it's all of the above. So I'm gonna give you a few, just a few sights and sounds from down there. So obviously uh, famous pyramids all over Mexico. So the ones on the left there, the pyramids of Teotihuacan, uh, not too far outside of Mexico City, uh, built way back by the Aztecs, uh, the Pyramid of the Sun, the Pyramid of the Moon. Um, on the left, uh, the other major uh, influencing uh, uh, Indian tribe there, which is the, the Mayans. So that's actually in the Yucatan there, uh, the, the castle um, or El Castillo in Chichen Itza. Uh, Mayans are also famous you know, really for being one of the originators of sophisticated map levels. So if, if you ever saw the old movie Stand and Deliver, uh, that's they talk, the uh, I think it was James Edward Olmos was talking to his students saying, you know, mathematics, it's in your blood. So that, that really is true for, you know, for the Mayans. Now, probably one of the most famous sculptures, and you've probably seen on your uh, tour books or maybe in a travel agency poster, is the Aztec sundial. Um, it was actually sculpted back in the 1500s you know, by the Aztecs. It, it's in the Natu uh, National Anthropology Museum in Mexico City. Um, they never really have to worry about it getting, getting stolen because it's about 54,000 uh, pounds in weight. And it, in the center there is the Aztec sun god called Donat Tiun. And it, um, he's kind of the patron god, if you will, of Aztec warriors. And the, the sundown really depicts kind of the essence of the Aztec religion. There's a lot of, you know, kind of blood sacrifice and making sure that, you know, crops... Uh, we're, we're good if by getting rain, so it was uh, pretty uh, illustrative for uh, for folks that way. Yeah, obviously, um, in the 1500s, the uh, the Spaniards came uh, to a lot of, of Latin America, and they came to you know effectively conquer the uh, Mexico and the Aztec tribe. So, a good old Hernan Cortez came in 1521. He's, he of the famous you know burn the ships, if you will, <laughs> and they got to Veracruz, Mexico. Some of the folks were saying, well, so how long are we going to be here? And he says, well, <laughs> until we're successful, let's burn the ships. You're not getting back home to Spain soon. The interesting thing here about the, the cathedral in Mexico City is that it's kind of sinking <laughs> into the subsoil there. And that's because Mexico City, the, the capital of Mexico, was built where the Aztec capital was originally, Tenochtitlan. And that, it was originally built uh, on a shallow lake, and on, on the, uh, the main part of Tenochtitlan was just an island. And so, unfortunately, <laughs> trying to keep buildings from sinking has kind of been a problem ever since uh, the 1500s. This is on the main downtown square in uh, Mexico City called the Zocalo. Oop, all right. 
All right, now for a few sights and sounds of Mexico. You, you may be familiar with uh, the mariachi bands, even if you've gone to a Tex-Mex restaurant in the States. Um, you know, the origin of the mariachi bands kind of goes all the way back to about the 1700s in the central western state of Jalisco, where the city of uh, Guadalajara is. <clears throat> and they mostly played string instruments. The, the picture you see here, kind of that look with the big sombreros and what they call the charro outfits, is kind of more of a... Uh, you know, 1900s uh, development from that perspective, as well as the addition of, uh, you know, brass or, you know, a trumpet from that perspective. And uh, they, you'll often see them kind of wandering around in Mexico City or just about any city. They'll do weddings, they'll do, you know, big family events and all that. Uh, the picture on the right, maybe is a little different, is called the Volandores de Papantla. So this goes back about 450 years, a tribe on the Gulf of Mexico, where they literally climb about a 100-foot bowl and go swinging around. So let's, uh, let's take a little deeper look at that. Let's see if we can get to our... We'll get to the mariachis. All right, so the next time you have a wedding reception or any kind of major event, I'm sure we can find some mediachis to come and, and play for you. So let's take a look, look at the uh, Volandores or the Flyboys. Uh, actually, Dina and I and my wife uh, saw some of these folks uh, when we were down in Mexico City on a Sunday uh, afternoon. It was interesting. Let's see here. Sorry. Let me see if I can get to the next one. Oops. No. Okay. Let's try that. All right. to join them and uh, participate when we were in Mexico City, we kind of respectfully decided to decline. We just didn't think our insurance probably would cover that, but uh, it looks like it would be kind of fun anyway. So just a few sights and sounds from Mexico. So now just to give you a little more of a kind of geographic context, I'll, I'll warn you in advance, you know, prior to my career in financial services, I was actually a social studies teacher in junior at the junior high level, so kind of like all this kind of context. So. Uh, if you're not interested, then this is the time to multitask and you know check your balances or do whatever you want. So Mexico is really a pretty big uh, country. It's about the 13th largest uh, in the world, uh, bounded on the north um, by the U.S. and on the south by both Guatemala and Belize. Uh, on the west, uh, you've got the Pacific Ocean, and on the east, you've got the Gulf of Mexico. And it's, it's really a very geographically diverse country in that up north it's fairly kind of hot dry and even desertish you get to the central part uh, of Me mexico around say mexico city there in jalisco it's actually high plateau um, so you have 
Mexico City up there at about five thousand or seven thousand feet. Um, Guadalajara, the second largest city in the country, is about fifty two hundred feet. And then if you keep going south, you really get more into tropical, um, you know, lush vegetation, uh, very hot and steamy from that perspective, and, and very mountainous by the time you get down to places like Oaxaca and Chiapas and, and the like. So it's very, very different uh, depending on where you are. Oops, sorry. Okay, just a few facts here. So it's about the 10th largest country in the world and about a little over 21 percent of the people actually identify as indigenous so again there's really always been even in all the culture and history of mexico this continued theme of kind of the mix of the native population that was there from way back with um the spanish that came later um, as i mentioned it's the 13th largest country in the world um, from kind of a political structure, there actually are 31 different states. Uh, the largest city and capital is Mexico City. Uh, it's the largest city in uh, North America at about 9.2 million people. By contrast, uh, New York City, which is the largest city in the U.S., has about 8.8. From a language perspective, it's also very diverse. So Spanish is really, I guess you'd say, the official main language, but there's 68 other Amerindian languages that people people speak. Uh, Mayan is pretty predominant, uh, especially down in the southern uh, states or some uh, rendition of Mayan. Um, there's also a language that's spoken a bit in the central states called Nahuatl, and that really is the language that's closest to the original Aztec or, or the Aztec Indian tribe from that perspective. Um, from a, again, from a politics perspective, the current president is a guy named Andres Manuel López Obrador, or AMLO. Um, he's a bit of, I'd call him more of a left-wing populist version of Donald Trump from Mexico. <laughs> um, he's from the Morena Party. Um, all presidents uh, serve a six-year term, just one term. So he is uh, about halfway through. And... Um, Okay. In 1938 was really where I guess you'd say the democracy kind of first was implemented in Mexico, although one party pretty much ruled <laughs> from 1938 uh, to 2012. That was the pre-party or the institutional revolutionary party. But after 2012, other parties um, uh, actually were able to win um, elections. Uh, they've kind of gone back and forth a little bit since then. Taking a look at religion in Mexico, obviously uh, it's still pretty predominantly Catholic and up from the Spanish influence from way back, although that percentage has actually declined over the last 50 years. So it was about 96% in 1970, and by the time you get to 2020, it's down to 79%. Now, some of that, I guess, is the good news. It was driven by the rise of the evangelical church in country. Uh, the downside is some of that percentage uh, drop was due to just an increase of secularism. People just not believing in anything. Um, Protestantism really has grown rapidly, say, in the last 20, 30 years. Um, depending on the different uh, sites you go to, it's about 11% uh, of the population, and up from 1% in 1970. And the largest percentage of uh, Protestant denominations are, are the Pentecostals. Um, Protestants are strongest uh, in both the northern border states with the U.S., but also in the south. Um, in contrast, if you go to the central part of Mexico, say around where Guadalajara is, Guanajuato, Aguas Calientes, or even Mexico City, there virtually is no evangelical presence from that perspective. It, if you walked around a neighborhood that I actually spent a summer uh, way back in the Stone Ages when I was in graduate school in Guadalajara, and if you'd walk around, say, a, a fairly middle class or upper middle class neighborhood, you would see little signs that say no evangelicals, or okay? like, kind of like, you know, no, solic no soliciting, it'd be no evangelicals, please don't knock on the door, we don't want to see you. So a little different that way. Looking a bit at the Presbyterian Church in Mexico, its background, so British missionaries came in in 1827 and started early the work of planting churches. Uh, the first Presbytery in Mexico was formed in Mexico City in 1885. And then kind of an interesting <laughs> thing occurred in 1914. So the major uh, U.S. denominations kind of got together and say, well, how do we most effectively expand in Mexico? And they came up with what they called the Cincinnati Plans. They were actually in Cincinnati at the time. So 
they said, okay, in the southern states, Presbyterians, you guys get that area. In the north, the Methodists, you guys get that. And then we'll kind of just let it be a free-for-all in kind of the central part of the country. Now, if you just were talking to some of our Mexican colleagues down there, they said, well, was it real popular with the locals? Instead of calling it the Cincinnati plan, they called it the assassination plan. And because if you were in a, say you were a Presbyterian church in the north, overnight you had to become a Methodist church. And, some, and again, slight theological difference between the <laughs> Presbyterians and the Methodists. So you literally just kind of had to turn over your building and, and leave if you didn't become either a Methodist in the north or a Presbyterian in the south. So it really wasn't uh, just locally sensitive from that perspective. And that's also what kind of drove the National Presbyterian Church of Mexico to kind of form and kind of separate, if you will, from us gringos in the north. Um, and they kind of formally cut ties with a lot of foreign uh, missionaries in 1972. Presbyterians in Mexico continued. So um, as of pretty recent counts, there's about 3 million Presbyterians in 6,000 congregations across uh, the country. It's about eight synods and 50 Presbyteries. Um, and not surprisingly, because of the Cincinnati plan, the Presbyterians really are the strongest in the southern states uh, in Mexico. So 46% of all uh, Presbyterians are in the state of Chiapas. That's the state furthest south and borders uh, Mexico. And so you might say that, you know, the southern states are kind of the equivalent of the southern Bible Belt, uh, at least for Presbyterians in the country. So the states of Tabasco, Campeche, and Yucatan. Um, and across the country, there are uh, 13 different Presbyterian seminaries that uh, folks can go to. Now I want to just shift over to talking about what the Outreach Foundation has been doing to partner with both seminaries and the church in Mexico. And the work there really has been going on um, for about the last 30 years. It started with a couple seminaries and then there's also some new work that uh, Dina will talk about that we just initiated last year. So again, just uh, giving a little geographic visual for you know kind of where we'll be talking about. So the National Presbyterian Church is actually headquartered in um, in Mexico City. Um, we'll talk a little bit about two seminaries that we visited in October. So there's Sureste Seminary down here in Via Hermosa, Tabasco, and then there's San Pablo Seminary over here in the town of Merida, Yucatan. We'll also talk about a couple different. Um, uh, church plants, one in Oaxaca, the capital city, and one also down by the border in a city called Tapachula. And sorry, Todd, my graphics aren't too good there, but down in the uh, southern Campeche is where Todd does his uh, cistern work. So that's kind of just a little geographic orientation. Uh, so the, the first uh, partnership we'll talk about is Sureste Seminary, or Southeast Seminary. It's in the hot and spicy town of Villahermosa, Tabasco, the capital of Tabasco. Um, that seminary was founded in 1985, and the Irish Foundation has been involved pretty much from, from the start. And its focus really is on training uh, men and women from the states of Tabasco and Chiapas, mostly. Um, they can receive both bachelors of theology as well as um, MDivs, or Masters of Divinity, down there. Um, the Irish Foundation has been very involved in providing uh, scholarships um, to students. So literally all of the current um, student body of, of Bachelor of Theology candidates, that's 31 people, get a, um, about 50% scholarship from Outreach Foundation partners. Uh, just take a look at some of the professors down there in at this Resty Seminary. Really, some amazing folks that we got to meet in October. So on the left there is uh, my good friend Pastor William. So pretty amazing guy. He must be all of like 23 years old. He was able to get through both his undergraduate and graduate ed education, then came back to teach uh, Greek there at Soreste. And in his free time, he raises a family of five, and he also is a full-time pastor on the weekend. So and. Not a whole lot of free time, but just a, an excellent guy. Um, on the right there is Professor Juan Marcos Leon. 
He's a professor of Hebrew. He teaches four different classes of Hebrew there at Sodeste. And the amazing thing about uh, Juan Marcos is that he literally initially taught himself Hebrew. He, he, he always had an interest in it, wanted to be able to teach it, just went to the library, got a Hebrew book, and just started learning. And he's since gone on to have some additional training both in Israel as well as Peru. But it's, it's pretty amazing what you can do if you, I guess, put your mind to it. Uh, another interesting ministry that's supported down in Sureste is the Ministerio Reforma, or the Reformed uh, Ministry. So it's a television and radio uh, programming uh, ministry. And so all the Spanish language programming uh, for Latin America is provided and done out of Sureste. And a lot of the professors uh, provide content, if you will. Um, Ministerio Reforma is heard on 610 different radio stations across uh, Latin America. And our friend, uh, Professor Juan Marcos Leon, he, uh, over April and May, he's been doing kind of a, a daily um, uh, discipleship um, seminar. Just to take a look, uh, when we went down, we actually got to meet the entire faculty, staff, and all the students uh, October. Uh, so it was in their nice chapel. Um, it was the first time that the group had gotten together for the, in two years, obviously because of COVID. Luckily, as of January, they're back uh, you know, on site uh, from that perspective. Uh, we've also been through our, uh, the goodwill of our Outreach Foundation partners working with them to help repair their dormitory. So the men's dormitory got torched a couple of years ago. It was just a, a major fire. So uh, that we're helping them to kind of clean it out, um, re kind of refurbish it, get a new HVAC system, uh, all of that. So that's just inspecting the damage there with the construction lead. And uh, with that, I think I will, oh, actually, sorry, I'll go to San Pablo next. Um, so the second seminary that we went to was down in Merida, down far south in the Yucatan called San Pablo Seminary. We got a, a bit of uh, climate whiplash in that we, we started out down in Tabasco at about five feet elevation. It was 95 degrees and hot and not much air conditioning. Then we went to Mexico City it was like 7,000 feet, 70 degrees, you know, kind of mellow. And a couple of days later, we went back to uh, San Pablo at about, you know, four feet elevation and another, again, 90 degrees and, and pretty hot and steamy. So San Pablo is similar to Sureste, provides uh, uh, seminary training, uh, both undergraduate and graduate. Uh, in addition to BA as well as the uh, Masters of Divinity, they also offer a BA in sacred music, uh, a diploma in biblical counseling, as well as uh, a doctor of ministry or a, or a D-men. Um, they're a little bit different from uh, some of the other, um, or from Sureste, in that they have students from uh, uh, both the southern part of Mexico, but also from Guatemala, Honduras, Chile, and uh, Colombia. Now, interestingly, uh, if you go back to the plan Cincinnati that we talked about, um, the Protestants also, uh, the gringo Protestants also split up uh, evangelism for uh, Central and South America. So the Presbyterians got to uh, do church planning in Chile, Colombia, and Guatemala, whereas the uh, the Methodists got um, Costa Rica and, I forget, and, on, and one other country. So <laughs> still the knock-on effect from that. Uh, one of the unique aspects of San Pablo is that a lot of the students uh, are fluent in Mayan. That's their first language, and a lot of them are going back to uh, pastor churches either in um, Mexico or, or Guatemala. So uh, it's kind of a unique from that uh, perspective. And they also are doing a great job, especially you know, during the time of COVID, of using you know, online platforms to be able to train you know, lay people, uh, people that are on session, elders, and 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 that. Uh, when we were down there, we also got to visit with one of um, one of our partners, if you will, a, a global worker, but the guy named Don Waymeyer. He's been a professor down in um, Merida area for uh, quite a while. He also pastors a small church on the outskirts of Merida. So we met met with him and some of the professors there, and then another shot there of uh, Dina and I with uh, Rector Ramos. Uh, in case you're wondering, Dean is on the right and I'm in the center. It was on the left. So with that, I will turn it over to my compañera de trabajo and part of the Latin American Dream Team, uh, the Reverend Dina Chandler. Thanks, Doug. Great time with Doug and 
his wife, um, and part of our time was spent with the National Presbyterian Church in Mexico City. And here you can see uh, part of our team, minus um, Doug's wife, uh, but with the staff of the National Presbyterian Church. We were especially excited about this, at least I was, because it's been a while since we've had a connection really with uh, the church uh, as a whole in Mexico City uh, of the National Church. Doug had mentioned um, a little while back that there are just under 3 million Presbyterians in Mexico and 6,000 churches. And so to help you understand a little bit about what that means in relation to us in the U.S. currently, you know, we've, we've got a couple of Presbyterian denominations, but in the Presbyterian Church USA, we have 8,800 churches and 1.2 million members. Uh, in ECO, we've got a lot of ECO churches who are a part of outreach. There are 383 churches, about 137,000 members. And in the EPC, the Evangelical Presbyterian Church, there are 637 churches and 122,000 members. So to put things in perspective, there are twice as many Presbyterians in Mexico as there are in the US. That's, um, it was a significant finding for me. They're facing many of the same kinds of issues that we've faced, um, especially with younger people, uh, younger people not being a part of the church. And one of the things that was encouraging uh, to us while we were there is their vision for that. that there are currently 40 million people in Mexico ages 12 to 29. And so the leadership of the national church, especially, especially Pastor Adolfo, who's the third from the left in this picture, is to reach more and more young people. And they are doing a number of different things to try to do that. One of those things was to take, um, take advantage of what they call the opportunity of COVID. And I love the fact that they chose that word opportunity. And so they, like many of us, could not worship in person. And so they were able to start up more online platforms in order to do that. And more and more young people signed on and became a part of that. Uh, as they are trying to put forth this vision to the National General Assembly, they're getting some kickback um, from folks who are saying, oh, these things will never work. Uh, but they are still committed as they should be to reaching uh, younger and younger folks. Um, there's something else I was gonna tell you about that. Oh, their, their vision um, is for the future and for younger people. So they have had two primary goals for the national church. And that is number one, to plant churches. And uh, number two, to support churches that are struggling. So. You want to give us the next slide, Doug? Have you got that? So they've got a, a, a vision that's called 10 and 10, and that is to plant 10 churches. And they believe the best way to transform and influence a city is by planting new Presbyterian churches. So it is, again, not just about church plants, but about going out further and further from that, uh, which is a, really a wonderful vision. So um, next you can see a, a map of the places that they're targeting for that. Um, and in these different cities, you'll see that part of what they're targeting is places where in many ways there are already a strong presence, which we find in the South with Presbyterians, but they're also trying to plant uh, in the central part of the country and up in the Northern section where there've been fewer Presbyterian churches over the years, uh, which is a, a significant thing for them to do. One of the things that's interesting about that is that the majority of their pastors come from the South and those people who are, are desiring to be church planters are pri primarily from the South who are going to the North in order to do that. So what's the next one we've got, Doug? 
Okay, so this is one of their church plants. While we were meeting with them uh, and meeting especially with their evangelist, Pastor Isau, he um, presented to us two pastors who are doing some an amazing things in church planting. And one of those is Hospital de la Fe. Uh, Hospital of Faith is what it means. And this is a plant in Oaxaca. Um, it was planted just in 2020. It's uh, far south, it's not the farthest south in Mexico, but it's pretty far south. It is an area that's very rich in culture, but it is also the second poorest state in Mexico. 70% uh, of the people in Oaxaca are below the poverty level. And it's a melting pot of religions in that area. But by melting pot of religion, we mean that religion is based more on tradition than it is on a faith statement or on a theological persuasion. And so uh, in Pastor Osorio's words, it's just ripe for evangelism. And so the goal of Hospital of Faith is to show grace for Christ and to have a heart for service. And I love the name of this place because their name comes from the belief that we're all broken, we're all sinners, and we're in need of healing by the Savior. And their vision at this church is to reach young families and students at a nearby university and to train them up to be disciples. They're a church that wants to be about discipleship that is not just about Sunday mornings, that goes, but that goes beyond that. This is uh, one of their statements that you can actually find in their Facebook page. And I encourage you, if you do Facebook, to, uh, to look at it. I, I look at what they have on there every day, and you can translate it into English. But this is a, a fantastic statement. The tragedy of these times is that we've turned our temples into museums for saints and not hospitals for sinners. And a big part of their vision is kind of a laying a foundation through this so that people know they don't have to clean up their act in order to come and to be a part of what it is that they're doing there. And uh, they're doing a wonderful job of it because outreach really is taking place. You wanna get the next one there? So it's, uh, again, it's this church plant, the um, congregation of 87, it's now over 100. And they uh, are envisioning renting a space. Another church that we'll look at is, is buying a space, but there's, is to rent a permanent place that is near the university. There are many university students in Oaxaca and to uh, attract young families. And for those students, they wanna have a place where they can come and hang out and have coffee and recreation and hear musicians and we get swept up in the love of God as a result of all of that. This is their worship team. They're doing some amazing things. And again, you can watch them and listen to them on Facebook. Um, I think you'll find it to be an encouragement. And then they're also doing some other outreach like this, uh, a prayer night that they had in downtown. Uh, like many of the churches that we were discovering, they're really taking advantage of uh, media. And so they've had an online presence. Uh, this is from their Facebook. They were actually last year during COVID, they were using eight different kinds of platforms to reach out. And as we know, there are many different platforms people are using. And I love this graphic uh, where on the right-hand side, which says Hospital de, de Pecadores, Hospital of Sinners. Uh, and, you know, what a wonderful thing they've done there with the stethoscope and the cross to bring it all together, because it's, it's really a wonderful statement of faith. They've also done some wonderful outreach with kids, with uh, young kids. Here's one of their superhero kid events. I mean, who wouldn't want to come to that? And then Easter was an amazing experience this year, especially as some of us experienced with COVID um, allowing us to gather more. And so Easter at Hospital of Faith had 100 people this year after only being in existence for about a year and a half. It's a really a wonderful thing that they're doing. So that's Hospital of Faith, and Doug's going to tell you about another church plant. Oh, oh let me back up, though, and say that uh, one of the things that we, um, that we came to a conclusion on because of our time there 
was that this would be a wonderful partnership for outreach. And so we have um, been able to do that and offer some financial help for gifts and are very encouraged mutually by what's going on there. Cool. Thanks, Dean. I appreciate it. Well, the other church planner that we got to meet when we were in uh, Mexico City uh, last October was a guy named Reverend Neri Rivera. And he's all the way down in the southern state of Ch uh, Chiapas in a town called Tapachula. It's really, really close to the Guatemalan border, about 30 minutes away. And they're, they're just doing a great ministry with refugees. And interestingly enough, um, Tapachula is kind of the main border crossing point from uh, Central America. And so they're literally at last count about 9,000 refugees from either South or Central America or the Caribbean um, that have kind of come across and are kind of in Tapachula. And uh, from talking to our partner, uh, Esau, who is um, with the National Presbyterian Church, a lot of folks kind of stop in Tapachula that they're waiting potentially to get asylum in Mexico. And the problem is what normally is maybe a two month process often turns into more of a 10 to 12 month process. So there's really an opportunity to reach out to a lot of folks um, there and Reverend Neri really has taken that to heart. Um, in addition to his family, if you include him of eight, um, they've got an additional eight people that are living with him, just refugees uh, from that perspective. Um, this church really has a great vision. Um, they've already been able to, even though a small number of, in their congregation, about, about uh, 50 people, they've been able to buy a piece of land um, in the eastern part of the city of Tapachula. And so their vision, as you can kind of see here with some of these um, artist renderings, they want to build a church, but the building's first phase would really be focused on uh, working with and, and serving the refugee community. So that really would be a, a kitchen with a dining room and also kind of enough space for folks just to kind of come and congregate and, and rest from that perspective. And as Dina was mentioning with the Hospital de la Fe, they would love to partner with you know U.S. churches to kind of help make uh, that happen. Uh, here's a little uh, look at what's going on uh, just even with their in their rented facility you know working with some of the refugees you know just you know providing the love of christ both you know in practical ways but also you know just you know witnessing to them uh, as well as providing to, for their practical needs so look at um our friend pastor uh, rivera that's with uh, i think five of his six kids as well as his wife uh, there so again it, it, to me it's exciting to see that i mean Reverend Neri is like mid fifties, but you know, just two years ago, he said, "Hey, I'm 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 going down and, and planting a church here." So it's great to see uh, just him, you know, stretching his faith that way. Um, and also, they have uh, you know an outreach to the kids. So uh, so like the looks like they're having a fun time. Unfortunately, we, uh, through the gifts of both a foundation as well as outreach foundations and partners, we've been able to come alongside um, Pastor Neri's church and provide the funding that's required to actually build that first phase uh, of their building. And so they're now just awaiting final approvals, you know, permits and things like that so they can actually start the building, which is pretty exciting. And now I'll turn it over to our good friend, uh, Todd Luke, to tell us about all the great work that he is leading uh, down in Campeche uh, to build cisterns for people. Doug, thank you. Dino. That was really interesting. Um, I guess I want to start by just trying to connect a little bit. I, I live in uh, in Spuhil, which is in the state of Campeche, um, famous for being in the middle of nowhere. Uh, we're at about a thousand feet. Uh, we're close to Belize and and Guatemala, but we don't have roads that connect us uh, directly to either of those countries. Um, yeah, you know, we talked about Sureste Presbytery and um, San Pablo. Over the years, we've had four graduates from uh, two from each institution that's worked in our areas. So the, the problem is because it's so poor and very rural, uh, we can't we can't keep them. <laughs> we can't keep good talent, and they move on. But interesting thing, we've also sent four uh, people over the last few years uh, to San Pablo and Sureste, um, producing pastors and. Um, music ministers, uh, two, two women that have gone on and are continuing to do great things in, in places like Merida and, and other parts close, closer to urban areas. So, and uh, it was Don Wehmeyer actually, who uh, was responsible for getting me down to Mexico in the first place back in the, in the 90s. And uh, 
I got down there in 96, and really our focus in ministry from, from the beginning has been just teaming up just regular old Presbyterians from the United States with regular Presbyterian church members in, in, uh, in our part of Mexico and just seeing what happens. Um, what started out as vocational training evolved into this ministry where we're attacking the biggest problem that we have in our area, which is clean water and uh, using church members to, to attack it. So basically we just um, went to a village and uh, I said uh, with the strongest Presbyterian church and said, would you guys be interested in, in building cisterns which to collect the rainwater that falls off the family home and and provides water on a year round basis. And they're like, that's absolutely what we wanna do. That's what we wanna, that's what we need in, in this region more than, more than anything. Um, and there's like, well, we'll do it in a, in a Christian context. And they're like, well, absolutely. The only reason we were starting it in the first place is because it's only in churches where you find uh, community members that are willing and able to work so well together. And so it started in 2002 is, is now still existing and going very strong. And in 2022, we've built over 650 cisterns that each one is family owned. And uh, it's the way we love to do it is to have a group of, of Americans come on down, um, provide the funding, but then provide uh, just work uh, with their hands, filling buckets of sand and gravel and helping feed the cement mixer. And we have folks from age 12 to 78, uh, most recent trip, we had a 72, 76, and an 80 year old uh, gentleman um, that, that, that were helping us out. And uh, yeah, I guess you could click uh, to the next slide. Maybe we could at least see what a cistern, yeah, that's what a cistern looks like. And that's a typical house in our region. People build their own homes. Everybody in our region is pretty much a, a subsistence level farmer, maybe makes about $2,000 a year annually. Not many windows in the homes because to prevent theft, the villages are always between like 300 and 500 people. And there is no way to get water other than from what falls from the sky where we are. We don't have the ability, or there is no um, subterranean water source. So digging wells is not an option. And the government, well, the Mexican government, you can never rely on them for, for any kind of project uh, that provide, uh, solve a problem, the water problem, especially over a sustained period. Go to the next slide, please, if you could, Doug. Yeah, when we, um, when we build cisterns, we incorporate the families. The families uh, have a very important part of the process. Uh, here we have two women filling water, but or carrying water for feeding the cement mixer, but they also are responsible for feeding the work crew that's in charge of overseeing the whole thing. And the work crew that oversees, they are also former customers. I mean, they built their own cisterns, became experts at it and see this as their ministry to share with other families throughout the region. Um, so these ladies will be cooking, but also working, and they'll be working with, next slide, um, you know, not just uh, their, their neighbors, but also with uh, the American mission teams that come, that come down to help. The guy on the right is in his 70s, the lady on the left is, is in her 20s. And it's, it's really, it's interesting how the work is, you know, we move, tons and tons of sand and gravel and really lend a hand for the locals that are that are learning how to build and building their own cisterns but to be able to help in that simple way is just it's very rewarding and it and it's spiritually uplifting to the guys that are in charge who uh, have really been struggling these last couple of years where they don't have the the benefit of having presbyterians to pray with and work alongside of uh they miss it and we're looking forward to 2023 where we'll have a much more of that but this summer we'll have four groups to lift their, their spirits and, and build some cisterns together. Is there another one? Is there another one? Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. We don't give the cisterns away. We actually, um, every family agrees to little by little repay the cost of the cistern over time. And what that does is that allows us for those that make repayments to be able to make sure that their, that their cisterns are functioning. Because these things, this one might be 20 years old. And uh, so we help with, with painting, we help with, uh, with upkeep, and really the only moving part is a faucet at the bottom, it's all a gravity flow system. But this way we stay in contact with the uh, cistern owners year after year, and we make sure that their cisterns are fully functioning. And it really gives us this ability to maintain this contact, maintain this relationship, 
And you know, actually in the future, we're hoping it'll actually help us uh, maintain our pastors as well. Right now we have a fantastic bilingual pastor. He speaks Chol in Spanish and he lives in the village where this project started. It's a village of 500 people. They can only afford to, to pay their pastor about $230 a month. We can supplement his income by having him working beside this, this young man here, um, painting cisterns and supplement his income. And it is our best chance of keeping him and his wife and his lovely family in our region for, for um, a few more years. So yeah, here they are making their payments. You, you can't, we know we're doing something special when people come year after year uh, to make an annual repayment on their cistern and they're happy like this guy. Uh, they're looking forward to speaking with our, with our foreman and, and, and our guys who've lead, led this project. They're so happy, they're so grateful to have their cistern. And that's exactly what we've been looking for. It's just something where just regular church members can go out and work from village to village, sharing God's love by doing something so incredible, so life-changing as building these cisterns. To be able to bring American partners into the mix has just been a great blessing. So uh, you know, that's, that's what we're doing in our little neck of the woods. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to share a little bit about that. Yeah, excellent. Thanks, Todd. Appreciate it. One of these days, I'm going to have to get down there and use my dyslexic uh, left-handed hammer and uh, other non-good uh, construction skills to help. <laughs> I think we've got some uh, time for questions, if anybody has any. Um, if we don't know the answers, we'll, we'll make up something that sounds good. <laughs> Okay, um, I don't see a whole bunch in the chat, but um, that's okay. Uh, a couple general questions. Um, for someone who's interested in a trip to Mexico, um, who maybe has only taken a, you know, Spanish in high school like me, are they still able to go? Would they need to know Spanish? Will there be people on the trip who can translate? Well, speaking for a trip, if you come to our part of Mexico with us, you don't have to speak a word of English, or I'm sorry, in Spanish. Um, in fact, at the work site, you'll quite often find that they're not even speaking Spanish, they're speaking an, indif an indigenous dialect. But between me and, and our other local guys, we're gonna be in really, really good hands. Uh, they're not just uh, language translators, but also cultural liaisons, you will get all your questions answered and be able to ask any question that you want and uh so no language is not a barrier at all yeah i would say that really is the same for um hopefully we'll be able to get um a trip soon down to you know visit some of these church plants the ones that we were, we've been showing you and you know dean and i can kind of do the comedy act of providing the translation and uh, it usually works out fine great and um let's see if uh for someone who goes on one of these trips and connects with the people, um, how can they stay connected once they're back in the States? What kind of long-term relationships are, are being built? Yeah, great question. I mean, I, I kind of, and Dina, jump in where I go off the rails here, that we're really kind of in the early stages of building partnerships with um, both the National Presbyterian Church of Mexico, but also with these church plants. And we, I mean, my vision, or I'd, what I'd love to see is, Churches in the states, you know, kind of creating a you know sister uh, church relationship with one of these church plants and being able to really ongoing have a, a long term relationship with them. And the nice thing these days is that you know between the social media platforms and you know the internet, you can kind of stay in relative contact, whether it be a Zoom or following them on Facebook. So. Yeah, ideally, that's I think the kind of partnerships that we'd love to be able to build over time. I know, Dean, other, other angles? Yeah, I would really agree with you about the social media, especially on Facebook. It's helped me keep up with some partners there and in other parts of the world where I've been with outreach. It's been a wonderful way to keep relationships going. Yeah, in our neck of the woods, we really don't have the social media component because we still don't have cell service or Wi-Fi is not in all the areas. But... Um, we have folks that have been coming for 15 or 20 years building relationships with the work crews because there's a consistency there and then sometimes they're working with uh, father son and even grandson um, so these relationships are neat and also with the uh, our support staff that takes care of the groups that helps with the lodging and the feeding um, they've seen entire generations of kids go from baby to, to grown up <laughs> and then 
uh, starting to hang out with, uh, with their children. So for us, these long-term relationships, a huge part of what the uh, short-term mission experience can, can provide. And, and it has great benefits on both sides of the border. We've enjoyed that, enjoying that over the decades. I don't see any other questions, so um, I think that might about wrap us up. Doug, do you want to say anything else? Oh, very good. Well, I guess I would say, um, you know, feel free to, um, you know, ping us with any questions that you may um, have. And I know there's going to be a recording, so if you want to share it with uh, any of your friends, that will be, I guess, on the Outreach Foundation website in the not too distant future. And um, thanks again for listening and for your, for your time and your heart for Mexico.